It was Roman Egyptian astronomer Ptolemy who first wrote about the possibility of a planet passing in front of a star known as a planetary transit. He was talking about the sun, though this had never been seen before. And he posited in his planetary hypotheses back in the second century AD that this was either because the planets were too small to see or that these planetary transits were just incredibly infrequent. It wasn't until 1631 that Pierre Gassendi first observed a planetary transit through his telescope. This was the transit of Mercury, as predicted by Johannes Kepler. And using his laws, we now know that Mercury transits happen 13 or 14 times a century. And in fact, there was one on the 9th of May, 2016, and I watched it from this very observatory. As with all of the planets in the solar system now, we use the Roman name for it, but it was originally called the Jumping Planet, as we discovered in the Mulalpin tables, also known as Naboo by the ancient Babylonians for their messenger god, and Hermes the Gleaming by the ancient Greeks. It's, of course, the closest planet to the sun. I know you knew that. Uh, its distance to the sun, on average, is 0.5 four astronomical units, or about 40% that of the distance between the Sun and the Earth. And that gives it an orbital period of 88 days. So over the course of a year, whilst the Earth goes around the Sun once, Mercury goes around 4.15 times. The reason why there aren't four transits of Mercury a year is because the orbits of the planets aren't contained all within a perfect plane. They're all slightly misaligned. In fact, that misalignment is biggest for Mercury. It's got a seven degree inclination out of the ecliptic, which is the orbital plane of the Earth around the Sun. Given that the size of the Sun from the point of view of Earth is only half a degree, that means of course Mercury won't be within our line of sight for a lot of its orbit, and only when it's passing through the ecliptic plane is there the possibility of a transit. We can split up all the directions within the ecliptic around the Sun into, say, the months of the year. Doing this, we can tell that only in May or November are transits of Mercury possible. And of course, that will only be the case in years where the Sun, Mercury and the Earth form a perfect line. In fact, transits during May are less frequent than the ones in November, and that's because Mercury has a far more elliptical orbit than the rest of the other planets. I mean, Earth is almost circular. But during May time, Mercury is much further away from the Sun than it is during November time, when it's its closest approach, knowing as perihelion. That means that there's a slightly bigger angular effect from the Sun from our point of view and makes those transits less likely. For May transits, there's a 13 and 33 year cycle, and for November transits, a 7, 13 and 33 year cycle. Where do those numbers come from? Well, you take the offset, the, the slight amount of a revolution around the Sun that Mercury moves from our point of view each year and multiply it by some number to get something very close to being a whole number. And it turns out that 7, 13 and 33 are just the numbers for Mercury's offset. In fact, the transits of Mercury are gradually drifting later and later in the year. Before 1585, they would happen in April and October. That's because Mercury's orbit is processing, very slowly rotating around the Sun just over one and a half degrees per century. It's a staggering that we can actually measure this, and we know exactly what causes it. Newtonian effects of the gravitational pull of the other planets can account for most of it, but not all. You need a general relativistic correction to completely account for that precession of Mercury's orbit. That's exactly what Einstein calculated. Of course, the only other planet which can pass in front of the Sun from our point of view on Earth is Venus. It's got the second most inclined orbit out of all of the planets, 3.4 degrees. And of course, being further away from the Sun, it's got a larger orbital period. Combining those two things, we find that there is a 243-year cycle for planetary transits. You'll get a pair of them, eight years separated, and then very long gaps. 
In fact, the last one was in 2012, and it won't be until 2117 until the next time Venus will pass in front of the Sun. I'm not sure I'm going to be around to witness that one. Transits of Venus have actually been historically very important. The one in 1639 allowed the most accurate measurement of the astronomical unit, the distance between the Sun and the Earth, and therefore the overall scale of the solar system. And our last transit in 2012 allowed us to test our techniques of detecting exoplanets. The transit method where we look for dips in the light from stars as an inference of the existence of these planets is one of the two main methods of detecting exoplanets along with the radial velocity technique which I discussed in my Planet Krypton video. But we've seen even within the solar system that when the planets are almost aligned within a plane, those transits are still quite rare. So how likely is it that planets do transit are the stars from our point of view on Earth. We are really insignificant. So the likelihood that a planet will pass between the line of sight of us and a star is small. In fact, we can work it out. It's a very easy formula. Just add the radius of the star to the radius of the planet and then divide by the distance away from the star that that planet is. In fact, in most cases, you can just ignore the radius of the planet because stars generally are quite large. And we can work out how likely such planets are to be seen. The probability of detecting a planet just like our own using the transit method is pretty slim. 0.47%. Those odds do go up if, say, we're looking for planets like Earth but around red dwarf stars in their habitable zones, which would be much closer in at 1.6%. Most of the exoplanets we have detected have in fact come from the transit method though using the Kepler mission which I talked about a little bit before in a blog. In fact recently Kepler just announced 1,284 new confirmed exoplanets and the total number is now up there within the range of 5,000. It is amazing that we've got so far in detecting so many exoplanets with the transit technique that we have to date. But from what we know about the likelihood of transits, that tells us really that there are so, so many more planets out there that we simply cannot see. Thanks so much for joining me at the Queen Mary Observatory to talk about planetary transits. Uh, if you did enjoy this video, well, you must have, you've watched it all the way through, please do click that thumbs up button and do share it on social media. That would be much appreciated. And if you want to see more stuff from me, uh, well, you can watch videos. There'll be some there. Uh, and also, you can subscribe. But you're a seasoned YouTuber. You know all this stuff. So I'm going to shut up now.